fashion friends uh, welcome to part one of my thrifted fabrics video and I'm joined here uh, by the wonderful people from a thrifty notion uh, they're one of my absolute favorite uh, thrifted fabrics websites and they're here to tell you a little bit about themselves and what they do so we're gonna get started uh, first I'd love for you each to Introduce yourselves and uh, kind of what your position is at the company. You want me to start? You yeah. start. You're the business owner. We'll start in the middle. Just like, I'm Libby. Um, I started a thrifty notion kind of by accident. It sort of wanted to exist. Um, people kept showing up to my regular fabric store and asking if I could take like these fabrics they had gotten from their mom that they didn't need or whatever. And I wasn't going to let them just throw them away. So I ended up adopting and rehoming a lot of things and it's just grown into its own full business at this point. Keller right. is with me from basically the beginning. Yeah, so I've worked for Liv since before Thrifty was really its own business and it was just kind of extra stuff in the building with our, our old business. And so I have gone from just working like a couple days a week as a student to being here full time. And I do a lot of just listing fabrics and things like that, as well as content creation and video editing. I am Mercedes. I am the newest. I've been here a little over a year now. Uh, and I am the marketing manager as well as a wearing whatever hat needs to be worn kind of person. So yeah, awesome. that's all of us. Yes. <laughs> I totally understand. And I would love to hear a little bit about why sustainability or kind of providing a source for thrifted fabrics is important to each of you. Do you want me to start this Go time? for it. <laughs> okay, so I actually started sewing partially because of an interest in sustainability. And there was a period of time where I was really into like the zero waste movement and learning more about that. And so when I learned about fast fashion, that's when I started sewing because I found that I could take things I already had and make them new items or take things that were damaged and repair them and different things like that. And so um, I actually got my degree in apparel and textile design and started working for Live during that time. And so for me, it was about um, like sewing was about sustainability, but then learning about the dead stock fabrics and all of that kind of just just came from there. Do you want to go? Sure. <laughs> um, kind of the same answer. I uh, definitely found my way here backwards with no sewing experience, which is something I'm still working to gain, but an interest in zero waste and sustainability overall is an overarching theme in my life. Um, and when I saw somewhere that was like putting that as their primary mission for their business, I was like, that's, that's really interesting. I really want to go see what that's about. Um, so when I got here and I learned about fast fashion, different textiles and in the impact they have on the environment, I was like, this is actually really important work. Um, and I want to help decrease the amount of waste that people are putting into the world. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I can't help myself. I'm a rescuer. Like if I see something that I'm like, but it's still good, <laughs> then I have to rescue it and see if I can find it a new home. So this in, in combination with me just loving to sew, um, is a really natural fit. Like I just, you know, I'll see someone that's telling me about, oh, we just took a whole, a whole big box of patterns and took them to the dump. I wish I had known about your business. And I'm like, oh, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> so yes, saving things that are still good is just kind of part of my DNA. So. Yeah, I, I definitely was raised with a very similar idea of uh, my dad always is saying, oh, we can save this. We could use it later. It could be something else. And uh, I learned to, to sew from my grandma and she was always turning something into something else. And uh, for me, I really appreciate your store because I try not to buy any wool firsthand um, because of the animal agriculture industry. Uh, so, you know, I'm always on your site checking, uh, are there new wools available? Uh, for all of you watching, these three uh, big dresses behind me were all made with fabrics from A Thrifty Notion. And uh, these two actually were made with the same fabric. And I got about 15 yards of a loose weave oatmeal wool. And I dyed this one to be a little slightly more yellow. Oh, 
And this one I dyed burgundy. So I got two completely different garments with the same set of wool from your site. And it's uh, it's exciting to get to try different stuff out. Uh, I have some more of that left over, which I'm turning into a like rose colored kirtle. Uh, yeah, so it's I, I really appreciate that there's some sources that you can find kind of larger amounts of uh, secondhand wool from uh, this one is from one of those de stash sites, but usually you only get a little bit. So you couldn't make a dress, you can make a hood, but it's really nice to have uh, a company, especially one that's online. Uh, so I was wondering kind of, you know, what made you want to go online for your, for your service? And uh, how do you feel like that affects your impact? Um. I mean, I was already online. <laughs> I needed to have an online business due to my life. Um, I started this business as I was transitioning from being a stay at home mom to having my kids in school and needing to work, but also needing to be available at various times and really wanting to be able to preserve some, some balance and, and have a little more control over things. So I started on Etsy and kind of grew from there um, doing various projects. So online was just an automatic for me. Um, a lot of these things that we get in due to being located in Kansas, um, a lot of people have zero interest. <laughs> like they're just like, Oh, my mom's, my mom's basement is full of that stuff. I don't need any of that. And I'm like, clearly this is not our target market. <laughs> so, um, going online was just kind of a natural um, extension of that. And because I had already experienced selling things on Etsy, kind of had the had the formula down as far as photography and what types of things you need to include in a listing to be able to sell online. So it was kind of automatic. <laughs> awesome. I'd also like to say one of the benefits of that is we noticed that when Thrifty first started, we had a lot more interest in things like the linen and wool and silk, the, the more um, expensive fabrics and things that are natural fiber. And so having the online customer base and having our customer base grow over the last few years, we've noticed there's been more of a shift in that. So for a long time, our mindset was focusing on those fabrics because they were really what sold and the other stuff just kind of sat around on the shelves. But now that our business has grown, we've been able to have more interest in some of the other fabrics, which is good because it already exists. It's already out in the world. And the, really the most sustainable fabric is something that does already exist. So even though maybe those fabrics aren't as sustainable in the sense of how they're produced because they're already there, we are so excited to be able to find the customers that do want those things. And so that's been really amazing to see and have that broader reach and bigger audience to find homes for those fabrics as well. Somebody out there wants the polyester. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, especially with like the difference in, in price points and with inflation and everything. Uh, I know sometimes it's hard to to consider buying something that's like fully wool if you're going to have to spend two or three hundred dollars to make a dress. So it's definitely nice to have some more affordable options out there to make costuming and sewing more accessible to everybody. And I'd love to hear more about how, I mean, you mentioned a little bit at the start about people were bringing their fabrics to you. And I'd love to hear as you've grown, you know, how do you source more fabrics as you get more customers because they, it is, you know, secondhand or dead stock. So uh, if you could talk about what you do to source it? Do people reach out to you? Do you reach out? Yeah, uh, it's a little bit of all of the above. Uh, we get a little woo woo about this because anytime we start freaking out about, okay, we're almost out of yardage, like we don't have any new fabric, something always pops up and it's usually something big right in the nick of time. So People will reach out to us with estates. Uh, we had a big one recently from Seal Peterson, who was a designer in Tucson. Um, her family had had her stuff in storage for over 50 years. So we got all of this 1950s gorgeous cotton um, preserved perfectly in that desert climate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that was massive. That that took up a lot. I'm, it's sitting next to us. I keep looking at it. Um, we have piles and piles of it. So things like that seem to happen 
right when we're ready to take the next step, right when we're ready to grow, something will pop up. Um, we do go to estate sales. We kind of keep an eye on Facebook Marketplace for um, either estates or like we got a whole bunch of leather um, when a business shut down. So we look at store liquidations and things like that. It's just, it's treasure hunting constantly. Um, we try to get the word out about what we do. And so people do find us and get in touch and say, can you help me? But a lot of times they are, you know, several states away. Um, so that requires some logistics uh, work, but we try to figure it out. Um, but yeah, it's really just a combination of, of luck and uh, I don't know, hopefully some karma, maybe. <laughs> we always say that this business wants to exist yeah. because really, it started with Finsline and then Thrifty grew and to the point where now Thrifty absorbed Finsline because it was it, it was the thing that wanted to keep moving. Mm -hmm. And it's been like the, the joke about how, you know, every time that we get worried about inventory, something comes up, like we just say, it just wants to, it wants to be a thing. It's like its own breathing, living unit. And <laughs> of course it's not, but it's interesting that it always works out that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's good to hear that it just like, keeps coming. I mean, I'm sure there's there are probably a lot of other warehouses or barns or everything just filled with random fabrics. So it's, it's really nice to see them getting a new life. And then I guess, is there anything else you would love people for, for people to know about your company or, um, you know, anything you feel like we didn't touch on, but you feel is like a really important aspect to sourcing and sewing sustainably? I mean, there are a couple things that we just, we do try to encourage within the community. Like we always say, check your stash first before you come shop with us. We'd really prefer you, show, you sew something from your stash uh, because it already exists for you. And then the shipping doesn't have to take place. Um, so check your stash and see if you can make something work. And then if you can't shop secondhand is your next option. So we like to encourage that quite a bit. Also, we are smaller than we might appear on the <laughs> internet. <laughs> Basically, it's us and one other person. And so it, it's a tiny team, but we're trying to do as much as we possibly can. Um, but sometimes we're a little slower on getting orders out than we would like to be and things like that. But also, I appreciate that we are small enough that we can still be very personal in our interactions with customers and take care of people. So yeah, I always enjoy your handwritten notes. <laughs> include with the invoice uh, it's that's always really fun um in terms of sustainability what else do we do we try to reuse packaging um almost all of our packaging that we send stuff out in is stuff that has been used before we just accumulate boxes and shipping envelopes um and they take over our space regularly so that's that's a monster we're always fighting um and we, we do try to discourage international shopping. We try to encourage people to check around their local area for a secondhand option. And like as a last resort, we'll absolutely be there for them. But just in terms of like uh, the ecological impact of shipping something overseas, we, we try to discourage that. And uh, one last question, uh, who gets to choose all the fun names for your fabric reveals on Instagram? Mostly it's Mercedes. She's our words person. Um, we do our best when she's not around, but often it's like, can you please name these? <laughs> so she's our magical word person. Finally put all the years of pop culture and reading and everything to use in my brain. <laughs> Very good for me. Yeah, if you, if for everyone who's watching, if you don't follow them on Instagram yet, um, I'll link it in the description down below, but they have uh, reveals of the new fabrics that are going to be released and they always have like a cute theme and a really fun name for each of the fabrics so uh, I always get excited like oh what's new every <laughs> every time uh, and it's exciting to get the what's new feeling with something that's old yeah. oh absolutely well thank you so much for joining me today and I hope that uh, if you're considering shopping for fabrics, maybe you check out a Thrifty Notion first instead of buying uh, some new fabric. Maybe they have what you're looking for already. And uh, definitely give their Instagram a check out. Check out their fabric reveals. And uh, you have a, a YouTube channel as well with a few uh, different videos on using your fabrics or scraps to, to make projects. So 
Uh, I'll link that down below as well. And thanks again for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you so much. And now welcome to the uh, cost cause tubers panel for the uh, thrifted fabrics video. Uh, and I'll have my uh, friends here introduce themselves and their channels. And uh, Casca, why don't you go first? Hi, I'm Casca from Crafting with Casca. Um, I do historical costuming and vintage and also do historical cosplays. Um, I use quite a lot of thrifted materials and love raiding charity shops and stuff like that. Awesome. And uh, Alicia, why don't we hear from you? Uh, hi everyone, um, I'm Alicia from T's and Q's and yeah I do pretty much everything. I do quite a lot of historical sewing, I do a lot of like Lolita and like Japanese fashion type things as well. There's probably random lifestyle things on there as well <laughs> so I do it with everything and yeah I, I pretty much also use a lot of thrifted fabrics. I currently have a giant pair of curtains that has been the fabric for most of my projects right now. <laughs> Awesome. I could totally relate to that. I've got a lot of curtains hanging around everywhere. So first I'd love to just hear, you know, what motivates you in wanting to choose thrifted fabric for your projects? Uh, should I go first? Sure. Yeah. Um, for me, it's two things. Firstly, money. Uh, Buying fabrics new can be expensive a lot of the time. So getting thrifted stuff does help like with the budget. But also the way I see it is if I'm buying new fabrics all the time, that's just adding to the problem of like fabric, like in clothes and stuff like that being in landfills and stuff. If I'm using thrifted items, then I'm recycling. So it's always good to like make sure that like like old duvet covers, old curtains, stuff like that don't end up just getting thrown away. They can always be used for something, even if it's a mock up. And uh, Alicia, what about you? Yeah, what's your uh, um, motivation for? Uh, mine, mine are quite similar. So I've like studied fashion and like I've worked in the industry, so to speak. So like I've like been behind the velvet curtain, I suppose, so to speak. And I've seen how wasteful it is. And how much it goes into landfills and it's like I'm not 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 really into that so I thought you know if I use stuff that's like already existing I also like feel a bit less guilty as well if I don't quite finish the project if I don't like it or if I don't wear it as often because I haven't used any new resources and I think it's it kind of puts the pressure off in projects I think as well just like, it's fine guys I didn't didn't spend any new resources on it and also it is usually a, a lot cheaper yeah, same for me as well. I'm I'm always very concerned about uh, not having my hobby take up too many resources or, you know, contributing to this sort of fast fashion cycle. And uh, even if I do buy any fabrics, I try to buy them from smaller independent shops. Uh, but being in, in Los Angeles, at least for me, I'm pretty lucky in that the thrift stores have a lot of selection of curtains anytime like a hotel or uh, any sort of, you know, production company is getting rid of a big set of curtains or fabrics or something. It's really easy to shop and uh, definitely the cost factor is a big one for me as well. I mean, there's a huge difference between needing, you know, six yards of fabric and being able to buy two sets of sheets for like, six dollars versus having to buy you know six dollars a yard fabric and and then having to be a lot more concerned you know like you mentioned uh, about oh if i don't like this well now i spent a lot of money but if you thrifted it you didn't spend a lot of money and you can kind of be a little more forgiving of yourself and the outcome of your project and so I'd love to hear kind of where, if you have like certain sources you go to the most for your thrifted fabrics, or uh, if you kind of like to shop around, or you know there's a specific place that's usually going to have kind of what you're looking for. I'll let Alicia go first this time. Okay. <laughs> um, I think my main place is the charity shop. So 
I'm, I'm quite limited in where I can go physically just because transport wise I'm quite limited but there's a couple of charity shops I go to there's one which is quite expensive which I avoid because they do that it's vintage yes even though it was from like five years ago let's charge like basically the price it was new but then there's the other one which is a lot better so that's normally where I go normally I would probably go for like bed sheets or curtains clothing is quite weird if it's a brand name that people in the shop know about normally they're like oh let's put the price up because it's like a popular brand but they're not fashion ex- experts I've I've like gotten posh well kind of posh like branded things and they just didn't know it was a designer brand for really cheap so generally ch- charity shops I don't really do stuff online I think shipping puts me off a lot of the time it'd, it'd be a good deal but by the time you have to pay for shipping especially if it's coming from abroad it's just well that was expensive <laughs> me I've got one fabric well, one charity shop that I love going to and um, it's because they do actually get fabric in. Um, I've been there and they've had like an entire like bolt of fabric like going for a few quid. Um, I got like, I think it was four meters worth of denim for a pound um, because people who like have maybe abandoned a project or something just dump it in this one charity shop. So they've got like big like bucket things full of uh, fabric. Um, I did actually find a mystery pattern in there once as well. Like all the pieces were cut out and it had the pattern and I was so tempted to get it. But I was thinking, what if it's like a size eight or something so it doesn't end up fitting me? In my immediate area, because this is one where I have to get like a stop or so on the train. Um, in my immediate area, there's places like the Salvation Army where I can get like bed sheets, like duvet covers, curtains, that kind of thing. And if it's a really nice design, then I'll use it for like an actual shirt or skirt or something. Uh, But if it's just kind of basic or maybe there's like a little hole in it or something, then I'll use them for mock-ups. I I will agree with Alicia as well on the whole dodginess of getting things online because I've thought about like trying some of the second-hand places online, but then you've got the issue of you never know what you're going to get. So you might end up spending that money, spending the shipping, and then it gets here and it's useless. So I much prefer to go in person. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah. You know uh, I actually shop for myself uh, for fabrics online a lot. And there is always that sort of, oh, I wonder how it's going to be. Um, the sites I've used are pretty reliable. Uh, I use a couple of sites. Uh, a thrifty notion, which uh, people watching will have just seen the panel with a thrifty notion, so uh, they'll be familiar with that. And I also use some of the SCA D stash Facebook groups, so you get a lot of people who kind of decided that they didn't want, you know, a large amount of fabric, or maybe they've had to downsize and they're trying to make some extra cash back, and they're selling. You know, I've got up to like eight yards of silk off of a D-Stash Facebook group. Um, I think it's easier probably in the United States because the U.S. is just so much larger than uh, a lot of other countries that there's kind of a lot more people to source from just within a lower price point of shipping. And so you won't end up having to pay too much in order to get the fabric to you. Uh, I do go in person as well, but and if I want to find something like a wool or like a silk, um, I usually tend to go on the th- the thrifted fabric websites, and it's usually pretty reliable because the person selling it does like a burn test so they can tell you what the fabric is, the content. Uh, actually, like everything behind me was made with thrifted fabrics uh, and most of them are from either uh, Thrifty Notion or uh, the D-Stash website. So it's been it's been pretty reliable for me uh, just in terms of helping other people declutter their stash and being able to get access to maybe higher quality fabrics, especially with the silks that would be 
you know, 28 to $40 a yard and being able to get something much cheaper to make kind of those very fancy elite Tudor or 18th century, 17th century type of gowns. And, uh, and so in prepping for this, we kind of chatted a little bit about, you know, the cost difference recently. And I was wondering what you guys have found in terms of changes in price recently in, in thrifting or, or where you get your materials. I have noticed a big change in a lot of the kind of big uh, charity shops, um, like the, the well-known like ones like Oxfam and places like that, the prices have gone way up. Um, I don't even bother with those places now. Um, I have more luck in the smaller kind of local um, ones, um, like the hospice ones and um, lifeboat charity and stuff like that. They tend to be a lot more reasonable. That's where I can get like a duvet cover for a couple of quid rather than like knocking on a tenner in some of the bigger names and how about you alicia uh, mine's quite similar but mine's a lot based on location so i do a lot of my like thrifting in the city center and because it's a city center i guess that's where things are most expensive normally it's also probably where you're going to find the posh designer stuff because this is what the posh people are but um on the occasion i can like go further on the outskirts things get a lot cheaper it's like ridiculous it's like almost half the price so it's this like weird thing of in general it's kind of become more expensive but if you go to the right area stuff hasn't really changed it's just getting there it's a bit of effort very interesting yeah i i haven't found too much of a difference in terms of shopping online i guess because a lot of it is if i'm on like a d stash is like an individual seller so they're kind of just setting a price at what they're kind of hoping that they're going to be able to get for it because they've already purchased it and not, not having to pay kind of workers, I think, and for a space. So they don't have that sort of overhead of, we have to store the material or, or store this, the clothes. So the price is still a little bit lower. Uh, and interestingly, the, the charity shop that I go to here, um it, they do haggling which is kind of interesting so you can say you know uh well maybe i don't really want to pay that would you take this and they are usually kind of flexible because they want to get the stuff out they've got you know huge huge i mean there's like floor to ceiling stuff waiting to go on the floor so they're kind of just like yeah okay uh, we'll, we'll get this out of here and, and be a little more flexible with that. Um, shipping has definitely gone up and I've also noticed recently a lot of places are adding like a 99 cent shipping protection charge because there's been a lot of problems here with mail actually like arriving. So there's a lot more costs associated with like shipping protection and, and all of that. But it, it's interesting to see even, you know, thrifting being affected by all of the inflation lately. And then one last question uh, would be, you know, in your ideal world, like what sort of thrifting situation uh, would you have available to you? I know it's kind of a complicated question, but uh, I feel like it would be like really great to kind of have a more open online space of like local ability for costumers and and crafters to kind of have a place that they can trade or maybe post you know what they're looking for and what they're looking to get rid of so it would be a lot easier to kind of trade with someone else and see oh this person is maybe considering going away from this fabric, they don't want this anymore, but they do want this one and I could trade them for that. So sort of a more, almost open like community space in terms of being able to share resources with each other. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It will be good. I mean, I know in the US you've got things like Costume College, 
so you've got the opportunity to like have a big meetup um and have like like places where you can like offload fabric and like get fabric cheap and stuff it would be awesome if we could have something like that in the uk as well um because share often like the kind of things that i find in charity shops are generally kind of just bits and bobs from projects that like and where i live as well like the average age is around 60. so i'm finding lots of just like poly cottons um lycra stretch fabrics like that kind of thing there's not as much like wools and linens and the kind of things that are great for costuming um so it would be great if we had like a resource like like that in the uk i can't think of like a good ideal i kind of would like just rows of charity shops but i really like like looking through clothes and then like finding like the thing you want i guess i just get a bit of a rush from it uh, I think it's like it's I almost joke it's like a bit of a hunt I'm like hunting for like the good fabric and like the good clothes so I, I would kind of like that but like also like an online community would be so good because like I, I would so interested in the costume and we was like what the fiber content is I can't go up to like the work in the charity shop and ask about fiber content because they don't know about things like that yeah, I'm, I'm actually surprised that there isn't something like Costume College in the UK because I know there's a big costuming community, especially historical costuming and reenactment over there. Um, I actually just went to Costume College because I'm in Los Angeles, so it's uh, I didn't even have to fly or, or drive or anything, really. Uh, I know a lot of people came from all over the place. I met somebody who... I think she was like from Poland and she had come all the way here for costume college. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm really surprised that that's not something that happens in the UK yet. So maybe someone will start. Maybe one day. Yeah. <laughs> Any last thoughts on, you know, sort of sustainability and thrifting and kind of the future of, hobbies like costuming with a mind towards you know as resources get more limited and you know what's what does the future seem like for these kinds of hobbies for me i think i think it looks good because there's so much knowledge online people sharing things that there's a bigger community now, like now and stuff like that. And people like, even though, yeah, we don't have like costume college and stuff like that, like people are always posting like, oh, I found this here. Like, um, like is anybody in this area? Do you want, like, do you need this and stuff like that? So opportunities for thrifting do open up in like, if you know what I mean. Uh, something that I wanted to touch on as well is there's a, always a lot of talk about historical accuracy and stuff like that and there can be some gatekeeping and stuff and with thrifting like one of the things that I, one of the messages that I like to kind of put across is that it's okay like you don't need to spend hundreds and hundreds of pounds to have a great costume. You can like make something that looks the part from completely thrifted items. Like the two bustles that I've got are made from stuff that I found in charity shops. <laughs> like most of the fabric that I use, especially like all of my mock-up fabric is charity shops. You don't need to spend a lot of money on like a calico fabric, like you can just use sheets it's a hobby where people on the outside can often look in and think well i could never afford to have this hobby and you absolutely can like it is open to everybody yeah that's a really great point. uh I, I definitely see a lot of that in the online space of you know the various levels of how accurate you have to be and 
Yeah, I, I kind of do that on my channel as well, you know. People know I'm making it from thrifted fabrics and sometimes it's the right material and sometimes it's not, but it looks good. So, you know, I I think there's only a certain amount of historical accuracy anyone can achieve anyway. I mean, we have a, a, electric lights. I mean, are we gonna limit ourselves to, you know, you gotta do this by candlelight or by, only in the daytime because historically, you know, You've got, I mean, even laundry. I'm sure none of us are really doing our uh, our washing of our garments that historically. So yeah, I think it, it is important for people to know that you don't have to spend all of that money and, and there's a lot of options for, you know, even if you go on eBay and you wanna find like a wool blanket that someone used and there's your cloak. You know, it's not um, something that you've got to, really worry so much about uh, un unless you are like picking a specific project that you're like this project I want to do absolutely historically accurately you know if you want to just you know make costumes and have fun and experiment and you know see how someone made something just in terms of patterning or or something like that you know you can still get a good historical experience without having to spend all that money one of my favourite things that I have made is a tiered petticoat to go over a bustle. And it was made out of like a gradient unicorn fabric that was a duvet. And it looks so, so pretty. And I would never have got that if I'd bought fabric from like a fabric shop. It was just because it happened to be unicorns on one side of the duvet cover and a gradient from pink to blue on the other side. It worked perfectly. Wow. Uh, Alicia, how about you? Any final thoughts or anything you wish we had uh, talked about and didn't get a chance to? I've got like, a, I guess I've got a funny story which is kind of related to this. So I used to work in like a, a retail shop and we had one customer come in. It was like a mother and a daughter. And she was like, oh, my daughter's jeans are like terrible, terrible quality. And we need to buy you some new jeans now because we've got like some party to go to right now. So they, she quickly like chose some jeans, buy this new pair of jeans. And she's like, I don't want the old pair of jeans. Just put them in the bin. And me being a little scavenger was like, oh, I'm just going to take those home. <laughs> and I just made a corset top with it. <laughs> so you might find thrifted items in the randomest of places. <laughs> that's absolutely true i i get a lot of friends who are like uh moving i don't really want this or my, my mom actually like really loves fast fashion and then she's just like i don't know here's like some bags of clothes do you want to look at this and i'll like text my friends pictures and be like hey this, you might like this do you want it so yeah i think there's like a lot of opportunities i mean i've even thought of having kind of like little like dinner parties where people bring stuff and then they can be like, I don't want these clothes or, uh, you know, fabrics anymore. Do you want to trade and have like a little swap? That would be cool. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for being a part of this panel. And it was really great to get to talk about thrifting and hear from other people who are doing thrifting in their costuming and be sure uh, everybody here on my channel to check out their channels as well. They'll be linked in the description. And I am very excited to see the rest of both of your videos for uh, Costume Symposium and just uh, the rest of time. So uh, be sure to go to their channel, subscribe, and I will see you all next time.